The ability of an engineering company to design and deliver successful internal training programs can make or break the growth of that firm. However, most firms struggle with building successful, engaging programs. Well, in this episode of the Civil Engineering Podcast, I'm happy to have with me Mike Dooley, principal at Bayer Becker. Mike has helped to build many successful internal training programs with his company. And in this episode, he's gonna share five items that you must consider if you have to build a program within your company. He also talks about something that you should do as an individual professional in engineering when you recognize a need for training. Let's jump right in. All right, now I'd like to welcome our guest on for today, Mike Dooley, principal at Bayer Becker. Mike, welcome to the Civil Engineering Podcast. Yeah, I'm a big fan of what you do here, so excited to participate. Yeah, no, it's great to have you. I know we've been talking about this for a while. So, Mike, in your own words, tell our listeners a little bit about yourself, you know, what you do at Bayer Becker. Yeah, so like you said, I'm a principal here, one of the owners. Uh, we're a firm of about 75 across four offices. Uh, you know, uh, multidisciplinary design firm offering uh, civil engineering, landscape architecture, planning, surveying, uh, transportation engineering. So really just those uh, site development projects uh, focus mostly in the private sector, but we've also got a nice portfolio of public work as well. Um, and I've been with the company for about 18 years now, uh, straight out of uh, school. Um, this is the first place I worked. So people tell me, I guess I'm a millennial by like the, the limits, but since I've been with the same firm for that long, maybe I'm not, I don't know. Um, but yeah, so I graduated from UD in 2005, University of Dayton, 2003, I'm sorry, and started here. And, uh, yeah, so I run our Cincinnati office, uh, is my, is my main day-to-day function. Great. And what was your, what kind of engineering work did you do when you were into a lot of the details of projects? Yeah, so we do a lot of down here. There's in, our office is in over the Rhine in Cincinnati, and so there's a lot of urban infill type redevelopment work. And so, uh, really, you said details. That's that's a great word for it. So because it's a lot of you know you move something six inches, it changes everything. So working with a lot of uh, uh, um, renovation of existing historic buildings, or in some cases, tear down rebuilds. Uh, for commercial, uh, you know, like mixed use projects, commercial projects, residential. Um, we also do a lot of outside of the urban infill stuff. We do a lot of work on campuses, you know, uh, higher ed type projects um, as well as some industrial. So it's a mixed bag, a lot of different stuff, but that's what makes it interesting. Yeah, it is. I mean, I think that's in general what makes civil engineering just a cool profession because you can deal with different stuff on a, on a very regular basis. And and so the reason that Mike's joining us today is because I think everybody knows in the industry that training professionals is really of the utmost uh, importance, really, as firms grow. Um, you grow, you hire more people, and there has to be training to maintain quality and keep people sharp. You know, but there's, there's always some debate as to whether or not, you know, in-house training is the best approach or, you know, using external providers and I know, Mike, you're involved with this with your firm, which we're going to dive into. But just in general, though, first, what's your kind of overall view on it? Yeah, I think, you know, so just like anything else, there's no one answer that's right for every firm. Um, But I think it really just starts with taking an honest assessment of what you think your firm is good at, what you think you can train and what you're willing to commit the time and the effort and the energy to train your staff on. And then, you know, maybe what are some things that that you aren't so great at and that you would feel you need that, that, that outside help with. Um, I guess I will say at a, at a high level, I mean, training of any kind is a step in the right direction. Right. So there's that old saying where like managers would say like, you know, what if we, what if we train our staff and then they go leave for somewhere else within the counter of that is what if we don't train them and they stay. So like, you know, uh, it, you know, the, um, the point being that the training of any kind is the right way to go, whether it's inside, outside, some blend of the two. But yeah, just an honest assessment of, of what you think your firm can do and what you would need help with, I think, is the step in the right direction. So now you've gotten involved at Bayer Becker of doing internal training programs yeah. in different ways. Talk about how that happened. Well, it, um, so we started with this uh, uh, program. We called it the RAD program. It was refined, advanced, developed. It was just kind of for 
at that time was for younger staff that were, um, you know, just to try to do some training outside of the normal everyday civil 3d, you know, grading, that kind of stuff, but just talk about some other things. And then as we developed that year over year, we started saying, well, you know, let's get some more feedback, like, which is what I just mentioned before. Like, let's get some feedback on what, what the, what our whole staff wants to learn, what our supervisors want to, want to teach. And, and so we, we actually did a, uh, a pretty extensive survey on where we think Bear Becker is at, you know, where are we at training our staff? What do we need help? You know, what do we need help with the areas that we need help with? What do we do a good job of? And, and really just an extensive survey of our entire company. That's how we landed on just really up in our training. I mean, I, I think with not just with young staff, I, I default to that, but like with any staff, I mean, everybody wants to learn, right. In, in some extent or another. And so, um, yeah, the more you can provide that, the better off you'll be, I think. And that it's really, our staff has really gotten a lot out of it. So it's kind of like, you know, getting a checkup, you know, the doctor, they take a look at, you know, different parts of your body and they say, Hey, you need help here. You need help there. Yeah. Let's, let's, uh, kind of diagnosing it and then taking action on it, which is great. I mean, I think that's a great approach. I see many companies will just do trainings to check a box. Hey, we're giving this training yeah. every year. And you know, that's not a good thing. Cause do you need it? Does everyone need it? I mean, we do tons of assessments because we do so much corporate training. And one of the biggest feedback points we get from the participants that people are enrolling in our programs is, you know, it's important that the training be relevant to me or else I'm wasting time. Yeah. So, you know, unless a company like you said is really going through taking inventory and see who needs yeah. what training, then you're not really, you know, being effective or efficient because you're, you're not, you may not be hitting the right people with the right information. Yeah, I think it's easy to like, you know, bring in that that vendor and do that lunch and learn year after year and say, well, hey, we did this, uh, you know, you kind of provide that training, pat yourself on the back and move on. Because I mean, we're all busy. I mean, we've, we've the day to day. It's a lot. There's a lot to get done. And so sometimes training can fall on the back burner. But uh, I think it's just really important that you stay sharp uh, with, you know, things are changing constantly. And so, yeah, sure. yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think and even what we're seeing here is I know a lot of companies that will come to us that used to just run people through a regular like project management training. Now yeah. they say, hey, we want to take the time to design more of a custom, very specific just to our company project management training. Again, realizing that the time and effort associated with developing it, you're just going to get so much more out of it if people are very specific to the work that you do there. And so again, that's just like what we're talking about, right? Everyone wants to maximize their time sure. and make sure people are doing the right thing. So, so with that, Mike's done some different training programs, worked on a lot of training programs there at Bayer Becker. So he's kind of put together five tips that he's going to walk us through here that he's found that can maybe help you to improve some of your in-house training efforts. And the first tip, which I think we probably touched on a little bit already, yeah. is do your homework. Is that what you were talking about with that assessment, Mike? Exactly. Yeah. Find, you know, talk to your supervisors and find out, you know, what does your staff need to learn about? Um, you know, and a lot of that might be the technical stuff, but then also talk to your staff and say, hey, what do you, what do you want to learn about? You know, and so getting that mixed uh, bag, I think, gives, gives a full, you know, 360 training of all the different skills that someone needs to have. Um, and, and, you know, and asking your staff also shows that you're invested in them and you're listening to them and, um, you know, maybe helps them play a role in how the training itself goes. Yeah, for sure. And I think that that's a really good point because a lot of times the supervisors don't know everything that their staff needs because they're not even that into the details on the project. So being able right. to take it at both levels is really important. And, and really, I really like Mike's point there also is you're, then you're telling your, all your team members that we want to invest in you. We want to know what you need help on and we want to provide that to you. And that's really important because, you know, going back to what kind of, you know, the question that Mike posed earlier, some people will say, well, what if we train people and then they leave? <laughs> A lot of times if you're doing what Mike just recommended and, you know, reaching out to them and saying, what do you need? We want to provide it to you. You know, people see the value in that. And they say, well, this company really wants to take care of me. They're asking me what training I need. They want to support me. They want to give me that training. I'm not going to go anywhere else. How do I know I'm going to get that same level of attention? Yeah. So I don't think it's just about doing the training, but it's about approaching them and discussing it with them and, and letting them know ultimately that you're trying to support their growth, which I, to me is huge. Yeah. I, yeah. Definitely for the people that are getting the training, you're showing that investment, but even for the people that you're asking 
hey, we think you're really good at this and we th- want you to train other people in this. I mean, that that I would think would feel great for that particular person to know that, hey, I'm recognized as an expert in this particular thing. And um, so it's, it kind of works in both ways. Yeah, for sure. All right. The second tip that you have for us is to find the balance between the technical and the human side. What does that mean, Mike? And how can one do that? Well, you know, with engineering, you know, I think that the tendency might be to focus a lot on the the technical side of things, but I mean, you know, the calculations and the software and all that training, it's important, but I mean, we're not robots, right? I mean, we have to deal with people uh, on a day-to-day basis and, you know, a lot of people, and I've heard this corrected here recently, which I think is great. You know, some people call it the soft skills, but like I've heard them you know, if they're not soft skills. These are essential skills that people need to, to function on a day-to-day basis. Um, so things like conflict management, time management, networking, active listening, a lot of the, a lot of things that you did really, really well and going over on your seller doer podcast or the seller seller doer training. Um, those are skills that that people need to know because you can you can design in a vacuum all day long the perfect storm sewer system or whatever. But if you can't convey that idea to your client or to whoever, contractor or whatever, if you can't do that effectively, then you're gonna lose, you're gonna lose that effectiveness. And if you can't take some of that feedback and and you know work out those conflict management type things and have those skills, I think you're you're only gonna go so far, or get you know, get so far with a certain client or just in your career in general. Yeah, great point. And in, 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 uh, our PM instructor here, Ann Tomalavage, always says that she doesn't know why they call them soft skills because they're actually really hard <laughs> to <come laughs> exactly and to develop. Um, but again, you know, this is something. Obviously, this is one of the main reasons that I left my engineering career behind to do this was just because I felt that these soft skills are so important and so necessary. They just don't always get the attention the attention they need because it's such a heavy technical world. But I think what's happening now that I'm seeing is because of the complexity on these projects, as they're becoming more and more complex, bigger infrastructure projects, more technology involved. Yeah. Now I think people are starting to recognize that we really need to be able to interact with people. We need to be able to lead large teams. You know, we need to be able to listen to people, understand what their needs are so we can fulfill them. So, you know, I think your point is a good one. And I think that more and more companies are starting to recognize it. But if your company hasn't and you're out there and you're listening to this, it may be an opportunity for you to develop some training programs around these softer skills for your company. And hopefully, you know, some of the stuff that we're we're sharing with you today can kind of help you to do that. All right. So the third tip that you have for us, Mike, is diversification of thought and experience. Talk to us about that. Yeah, I think, you know, if, you, if you're going to the same people and asking them for the same opinions on the same topics, you're going to get the same answers over and over and it's going to get stale. And right. So we found that like a panel setting works really well to where you're getting people from, you know, with Bear Becker, we've got multiple uh, service lines, right? So we've got landscape architecture and survey and civil, you know, all this different. And those panel settings have worked really well because you're getting, you're getting experiences that are just different. And and um, and outlooks that are different, and it just sparks a lot of really good dialogue. Um, and so, you know, when I say diversification of thought, you know, different service lines is a good way to do it. But even experience, I mean, we for one of our um, trainings on business development, we brought back one of our founders that has you know has been out of practice for 15 years, and he was giving us um, since just really talking to us about how he used to do business development, which was just incredibly interesting to hear about, you know, the handwritten letters and, you know, going through the Rolodex and calling, calling folks daily and asking them about this and that. And, and yeah, yeah. Some of that's dated, right. But the, 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 um, the ideas and the thoughts are the, are the same, right. Building relationships. And so um, it was good to hear some of that older, um, you know, just an older take on, on how he used to do that. Um, and then on the flip side, I would say, don't, you know, don't necessarily discount some of the younger staff, right? So a lot of times we would think of like a, 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 like a top-down training. We, we did one recently on time management where, you know, we had some of our younger staff talk about how they, how they deal with that. And it was really interesting to hear you know, some of the younger staff talk through how they, you know, how they, you know, when they're on vacation, how do they manage emails and, you know, all those different things with the time and how they do scheduling and how they 
when when do they do emails versus when do they uh, and when do they return phone calls? All those different things with time management that we all deal with. It was interesting to get the younger staffs um, input on that. So it's not always more experience telling the younger experience what to do. Yeah, for sure. And I think a big takeaway from that for me is, you know, this can really help you to leverage your knowledge across your firm, right? Like you said, you had that one person that really was experienced in BD. So you're by putting together a program, you're able to get him in front of everybody else and yeah. with what's in his head out to everybody else. And then from the flip side, like you said, you got some maybe younger professionals that maybe are more savvy in one way or another with something and they can share that with the others through a program, through a discussion. And that's going to let they, other people can leverage that knowledge. So I think, you know, leveraging knowledge is a big one. And I think another takeaway from that point for me is when we do training with companies, sometimes people will enroll, you know, many professionals in our programs and we'll take kind of, we'll do an assessment of everybody because they often ask us like, well, you know, if we're going to put like 15 people at a time, who should we pick? Should we pick, you know, one office? Should we pick a mix of people? And I always say, Listen, you could certainly go office by office, but you could also mix it up. So you get different people in different locations in your company getting to meet each other, getting to talk to each other, getting different ideas, like to your point, different thought, different experiences, different perspective. And so I think training programs can offer that really sound way to mix people up, get these different perspectives, get people to meet different people across the company, forge friendships, mentorships. And to me, like whenever I try to build training programs, I'm looking for kind of return on investment other than just the training, which in itself obviously is powerful. But if you have networking going on in your company, you have ways to to, to leverage knowledge. I think it's just beneficial. So I think that diversification of thought and experience is a really valuable one that you should think about if you're crafting um, a program within your firm. Yep. All right. The fourth one you have for us, Mike, is an emphasis on storytelling. What stories are you referring to here? Yeah. So just in general, I think personal experiences are just a great way to drive home a thought or an idea. You can, you can kind of, you know, list verbatim quotes from books and stuff like that. And I think that that it's, it's kind of good, but when you're putting a story behind that, something personal, it, it just goes beyond the generalities and the cliches. Like, so when I, you know, I, one that I always fall back on is like, when I'm teaching sanitary design for, for any of, for any of the engineers that are in like uh, site design, they know what a drop manhole is, right? Anthony, I don't know if you recall yeah, sure. yeah, and your experience, a drop manhole or, well, I ran into a drop manhole where I didn't know it was a drop manhole. Right. And so I had a design coming in uh, much lower than what I thought it could be. And, uh, and had to redo some things during the construction processes, which is never one, never uh, when you want to do those kind of things. But um, taught me to always look for those kind of things when I'm doing my my connections to existing. And and on the on the other side of that, we actually the company had to kick in some money because of lost time, and uh, which nobody ever wants to do, right? Um, but my my supervisor made me walk that check to that client and say, you know, we stand behind our work. We're sorry this happened, but uh, here's here's the check for for uh, you know for the lost time. And so there's a lot of lessons there, right? Like, hey, you know, drop manholes, right? Watch out for where your connection is, but also like how to handle a client, how to handle a conflict. All those things were wrapped into there. So um, to just say, hey, this is a drop manholes when it's coming in at this elevation, and then it drops down to this elevation. That's one thing, but to go go beyond that and tell that story is a whole nother. Um, Another good story that came out when I was telling you about that one of our founders that came back and talked about business development was that apparently, you know, and this is a this is a story that's been passed down years and years and years, so it's probably been warped one way or the other. But I guess there was a client, a particular relationship that he was uh, pursuing, and I, I I'm not sure how it ended up happening, but he ended up be, uh, kind of joining a, a similar church as this type of person, so he could sit behind this person at a, at uh, at at service every every week. So that's that's one way to do business development, right? But I'm sure it didn't happen uh, totally that way. But uh, just those stories. I mean, they they just um, it it drives company culture. It um, keeps things lively. It uh, you know it just drives the point home. So. Yeah, for sure. I mean, listen, people want to listen to stories more than they want to necessarily listen to a very, you know, bulleted training program, right? One thing after the next. I mean, I think that's just life in general. And I think, you know, at EMI, 
we're adamant about our instructors being engineers and having some engineering experience. And I encourage the instructors to weave their own stories into the training. And we've seen that to be very, very helpful because I think you can also explain a concept to someone, but when they hear about how it was implemented or an example of it in real life, then it's so much better. Like to your point, your, your issue with the drop manhole there, it's easy to say to someone in a training, there may be an issue and you're going to have to go to a client. You're going to have to take responsibility for it, but it's another one where you can give them the actual example and they can visualize you, you know, handing your client a check back. Right. It's like, wow. Like I don't, I don't want to do that. No, you know? no. So, so I think it can really, really open someone's eyes and help the content sink in essentially by them being able to visualize it. So I would definitely agree with that one. And, and if you're building an internal program, um, in your company, think about how you can have people share some of their stories or past experiences. It's going to make the training definitely go further. All right, Mike, your last tip here, number five was rinse and repeat. Talk about that statement related to training. Yeah. I mean, you, we kind of hit on it earlier, right? It's, it's going beyond the, Hey, I did this, this one training, pat yourself on the back and move on. Or, or like you said, check the box, right? Um, you gotta, you gotta keep tweaking these trainings, keep, uh, keep, you know, looking, you know, looking for feedback from your staff and, and, and keeping things interesting. And, and even with technology, the things that are constantly changing, keeping people up to date on those, on those latest things. So uh, don't fall into the trap of, Hey, we did this one thing and uh, you know, check the box, move on, really, really try to commit to it as best you can and, and make it a part of, of, of your culture so that you're, you're learning every day. Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more with that one. I mean, you have to constantly tweak and update your trainings to be as engaging as possible and as relevant as possible to everything that's going on. I mean, look what happened with this pandemic. Everything had to go yeah. remote. Everything. I mean, we rarely go through, you know, one of our courses at EMI without then looking through the evaluations and seeing if we could tweak some slides, change some stuff. Again, just because you have information. If you're giving a training course within your company, you should be asking for evaluations and feedback, and then you should be reviewing that feedback and hopefully making the course better. I understand that, you know, if you're doing internal training, it's not likely your primary role in the company. So it's not like yeah. you have time to spend on all the time, which I know sometimes is a challenge, but at the same time, you know, you do want to make sure the training is relevant. And from another thing that I'll add on to this one in terms of consistency is, you know, making sure that the program is given on a regular basis. I think that when we work with companies that come to us to hire us to do training, one of the reasons I would say like nine out of 10 times, the reason is, well, we do internal training, but we can't keep up with it. Yeah, that's tough. I would agree. <laughs> We're too busy. Yeah. You know, the people that usually give the training have a big project that they, they can't work on it right now. And the problem with that is that if your strategy for training is based around internal training and then the people can't deliver it, well, then yeah. you're not doing training. Then you're blowing your whole strategy kind of out of the water there. So that's why going back to what we talked about earlier on, I do think having a good mix of internal and external training can be beneficial because if you have some external training, then you know that that's going to get done. It's just a budget budgeting issue at that point, not whether or not the training is going to happen. And hopefully you can maintain your internal training. And if you get busy and something happens and you, you lose a quarter or two, you have it, you're not completely going without training. But that's something that you really have to think about when you're doing internal training is who's going to do it, who's going to be responsible for it, how are we going to ensure it's delivery on a regular basis? Because the last thing you want to do, kind of like to Mike's point earlier, is reach out to your team and say, hey, we want to give you this training and then not follow through on. Yeah. I mean, that's, that was, we talked about that a lot when we, you know, we, we spent a lot of time and energy getting the feedback um, from the staff and the staff said, we want to be trained. And so now we've got the information and to not deliver upon that is, is way worse than not knowing now we know. And so we really had to deliver on it. Um, the other thing I found out is that like, I think it was a couple of years ago, we did a really great training on like AutoCAD, like, you know, short, short, shortcuts and stuff like that. Well, you know, we grew as a company and then we've got new employees that weren't there for that, that training. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, so-and-so, you know, these three or four or five people weren't there. They didn't hear that training. So, oh yeah, I guess we got to do that one again. So that's the other, to your point about, you know, the, the constantly tweaking and, and making it a priority is that you get new folks in, whether they're, you know, new, new, employees out of school or just, you know, you've acquired a certain person or two and just making sure they're up, you know, up to speed as well. 
Yeah, for sure. And, and I, I believe it or not, I had a company that called us today about this because they said, hey, what if we want to keep doing a training with new people that get hired? Yeah. So we're helping them kind of do it on demand so that they have it saved and someone can access it at any time. But then from periodically, they're going to do it again live so that people can get it live and updated. But at least they always have something for people to go through, so to speak. So that's something that's important. And, and the other thing that I'll say real quick about this is that we talked about earlier on in this episode when, you know, Mike talked about um, reaching out to people and understanding what they need and trying to give them that training. What I've found through many of our conversations with engineers over the years is that what they care most about in their careers, and if you're a listener, you might agree with me on this, is their development, mm -hmm. not their salary all the time, not their title, their development, their career development and their career growth. And that's why we always, you know, tell companies that by giving this training out, people are going to love your company because they're focused on their growth. And if you're helping them grow, it's really important. In fact, one of the services we've been offering lately is creating like this career roadmap for companies so that their employees can always see where they're at in the career roadmap in that company and what training the companies are giving them to get them from one level of that roadmap to the next. And what we're finding is like, that means everything to people. So yeah. the stuff that we're talking about in this episode is really important in growing a firm because in a lot of ways, it's the lifeline of someone's career and it's what they really care about. And oh, by the way, if you scale them up in those areas, it's only going to help the company most likely grow and succeed in the long term. So yeah, it is really important. So, so before we kind of wrap up this segment, are there any other tips, last tips or pointers you want to make here, Mike, or do we kind of get everything here? Oh, I mean, not necessarily the training, but it does apply. I guess I'll say the one thing that's really helped me in my career was, you know, if you see something that needs to be fixed, step, you know, don't, don't wait for it to to be fixed, step up and say something. I mean, that could be, you know, with regard to training or it could be with regard to, you know, how someone's doing marketing or how, you know, how the company does its marketing or how it does its business development or the swag that the company has or, you know, all that stuff. Like, you know, if, if you're not satisfied with how a certain um, aspect of your company is going, then step up and say something. I mean, that, you're going to help the company and, and the, and the, and the supervisors are going to, you know, those people the, or the owners, whatever are going to see, are going to see um, that commitment from you knowing that you want to advance the company. And, uh, and if they don't listen, then I think you're probably at the wrong company, but you know, um, and that's always really served me well here. Bear records always really listened to my input. Didn't always act on everything I suggested, but, you know, listened yeah. to the input and gave it, gave it some good thought and, have implemented a lot of things over the years. So my, my engineering supervisor, when I was working, always used to tell me the squeaky wheel gets the oil. So he said, tell us, you know, tell <laughs> That's us one way to put it. <laughs> tell us if there's something wrong. And he said, we can't help you unless we know that there's an issue. And if you're seeing a bunch of errors being made, you go to your supervisor, Hey, I think we need training on civil, you know, civil 3d or whatever the program is, because yeah. I'm seeing stuff that needs to get fixed and it's not good for our projects. It's not good for the quality of our work. Or if you just feel like you really need to upskill yourself in a certain area, ask, hey, I found a training. You don't have to wait for an internal training program necessarily right. to be developed, right? If you need something, you need it. If it's going to help, like, like Mike said, if it's going to help the owner of the company, the supervisor is going to be like, well, listen, if this is going to help our projects, we got to get you trained. I mean, that's what I do with, with our team here. I tell them all the time, if you need training on something, you got to let us know, you know, yeah. so... I think that that's, that's really important. So let me just recap real quick, and then we're going to, we'll, we'll transition into our hot seat segment here. So we're, again, we're talking about, you know, some tips for building, you know, engaging in-house training programs within an engineering firm. We talked about uh, doing your homework. You know, Mike talked about reaching out to the supervisors and what kind of training they feel their teams need, the individuals and what kind of training they feel they need, you know, so that you can really build relevant programs. Secondly, we talked about finding a balance between the technical and the human side. You know, Mike talked about the importance of soft skills, which kind of I preach about here. I feel like almost every episode, that's really important. You got to factor that into your training. The third tip was to diversify thought and experience levels. And you need to talk to people with different, different departments and different divisions, different service lines, and bring them together to kind of have different thoughts weaved into these different programs. The fourth one is an emphasis on storytelling. You could have those giving the training, giving their own experiences as case studies or examples in the training. It's going to help the training to sink in and help people place those concepts into actual you know, uses for them. And then lastly, we just talked about, you know, rinse and repeat in terms of, you know, improving a program once you give it and delivering it again. So that there's a constant, consistent cycle 
of this training. And if you kind of can implement some of those into your internal training efforts, you should see some, hopefully some, some good success with those programs. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back and we're going to wrap up by putting Mike on the civil engineering hot seat. All right. So we're back with our guest for today, Mike Dooley, principal at Bayer Becker. And we talked a lot about, you know, building successful in-house training programs and what they might look like. But now we're going to put Mike on the hot seat here and ask him a couple questions about his own career. Ready to go, Mike? Let's do it. All right, let's do it. All right. So first question, are there any specific rituals that you practice every day? For example, do you have a morning routine, a lunchtime routine, something <laughs> that you do consistently that has contributed to your success? I probably did at one point, but now I've got three young boys. And so a lot of times I'm mixing in the work with uh, trying to get their schedules. But um, I don't know, I guess I'm, I'm regardless, I'm up early, right? You know, early bird gets the worm, I guess, you know, whether I'm getting the work in earlier or later in the day, um, just doing everything I can to meet the deadlines and meet the client needs. Uh, so every day is different for me right now. Yeah, for sure. But I think, well, first of all, I think getting up early is a routine. That's, yeah, that's for sure. I do that myself as well. But I also think that to your point, um, I think any parent, really anyone in the last year and a half has had all of our routines just up <laughs> with everything going on with COVID. So we're all probably running on less routines these days and we're just trying to get the job done. And I think that that's pretty acceptable right now. But I would say my routine is make my, make my family happy and make my client happy and try to do go. them both. Yeah. You do that. You're in real good shape. That's right. Um, all right. What's, do you have a book that you might recommend to our listeners or just a book that you found to be helpful in your career? Um, yeah, there's been a couple. I think mindset is is great. If you if you're familiar with that, I think it's Carol Carol Twick. Is that are you yeah, familiar Carol with that Dwick one? Mindset. Yeah, I, I use that one a lot, and that's uh, you know framing things in the right way, you know, to get the outcome that you want. I use that all the time with my kids and with my clients, and just in general, I think it's a really good one. And I think the first one I ever read, and I, to be honest, I didn't read through the whole thing because it's pretty dry. But I mean, how to win friends and influence people is probably one of the, that's like the cornerstone for like business development, right? And, you know, active listening and asking good questions and, and all that kind of stuff. So those, those two are, are, are really good ones. Yeah, no, mindset's great in that it does kind of talk about how you impact your own, you know, you, by your mindset allows you to grow or not grow essentially. Yep. It's really great. And, and I would say out of the 200 episodes we've almost had on here, I, I got to say 20, 30 people have said how to win <laughs> people because really it goes back to the soft skills we talked about and your ability to converse and interact with people in the civil engineering world is highly critical. Yeah. Like, and that book was written in the sixties, I think, or something, yeah. right? <laughs> Which is interesting. But also I think what a lot of people don't realize too, is that he did start Dale Carnegie by training engineers. I think it was electric oh, in like okay. New York city. He used to do seminars and that's where, that's where the book came out. So I thought that was interesting. All right. The next one, Mike, thinking back on some of your managers of the past, and you don't have to name names, but if you think about maybe one of your favorite managers, is there something you remember about that person that made them your favorite? We're just looking for characteristics of great managers in engineering. Yeah. I think, you know, to be honest, it's, I've really had one consistent um, manager in my career when I was, when I was working in that particular office. And then I kind of broke off and did and started running this office, but I'll say the the thing that I admired most about that particular person was it wasn't like a, uh, you know, get this done and then, you know, I'm going to go over here and do that. I mean, when we were hitting deadlines, really tough deadlines, and he was asking me to do really tough things, put in long hours or, or, or handle tough clients. He was right there with me, you know, the whole time, you know, he was, he was there, you know, getting an earlier, staying later, or in on those conversations with, with those clients or, you know, in the weeds on those projects. So it wasn't like, Hey, go off and do these things. It was kind of like we're in the trenches together kind of thing. So I think that's, I think that's really, really important. You yeah, know, that is a, a great point. I think that there's a really important balance that great managers can strike there in that they know when they shouldn't be in the weeds and they need to be yeah. thinking big picture, but then they also know when they need to jump in and roll up their sleeves and say, Hey, we got a deadline. We got to get this done. I'm here to help you out with that. So I think that that is a really, really important aspect. It's kind of like if you can't do both of those things, then you're going to run into an issue at some point in time for sure. Yeah. Yeah. 
All right, Mike, I got one final question for you. We call it the civil engineering career elevator advice question. If you got into an elevator with a civil engineer, you had 30 Ooh. to 40 seconds with him or her, and you could only give career advice in that very short period of time, what would that career advice be, you know, in that 30, 40 seconds? Yeah, I'm a big strengths finders person. So I would say, you know, find the thing that you're good at and get better at it and, and be the best at it. That's great. Um, and that, that leads to what we're talking about with training, but it also leads to, you know, finding something you're passionate about and, and cause that's good. That's where you're going to do your best work. Yeah. And if you're not familiar with strengths finders and it's a book and it's an assessment that you can take. And a lot of companies will have it take you know, people across their companies, take it that help you identify the different strengths of the different people, maybe in your department in your vision, your company, and then you can work around those strengths and leverage those strengths as opposed to guessing kind of at what everyone's good at and just trying to give training, you know, kind of like what we talked about before, not just giving training for the sake of giving training. Yeah. Or, or it's, and it's not really, you know, trying to fix your weaknesses. It's trying to strengthen your strengths, right? So like right. really, really hone in on what you like to do, what you think you're really good at, and then go down that path. Cause that, we talk about that a lot, Barry Becker. There's different roles you can have. There's design heavy roles. There's BD heavy roles. There's a lot of different places you can go. And so, you know, really try to have a clear vision of, of where you want to go and then, and then really focus on that. Awesome. Well, Mike, thank you so much for spending some time with us here on the Civil Engineering Podcast. You gave some great advice here on building training programs and, and really good stuff on the hot seat. So thanks so much for spending some time with us. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Civil Engineering Podcast on YouTube produced by the Engineering Management Institute. We're always looking for new ways to help engineers become effective managers and leaders. You can view all of our content on our website at engineeringmanagementinstitute.org and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel here for our weekly videos. Until next time, please continue to engineer your own success.